Yurud and welcome to our latest edition of the Iranian Studies Initiative Lectures in collaboration with the University of California, Santa Barbara. I am Ali Reza Ardakani, Executive Director of Farhang Foundation, a non-political, non-religious, not-for-profit organization that thrives with the support of its members. Our sole mission is to celebrate and promote Iranian art and culture, enriching the global community at large. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Domenico Ingenito for I Speak from the Edge of the Night, translating Farooq Farrokhzad's collected poems. This series is made possible with the support of the American Institute of Iranian Studies, the Persian Heritage Foundation, the California Humanities, and the Garamian Emrani Foundation. Please note that we will be holding a Q&A session at the end of today's program, so please do submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Farshad Somboldel, the World History and Cultures Librarian at the University of California, San Diego. Thank you, Ali Jan. Hello, everyone. It's a privilege to welcome you to today's online lecture featuring a prominent scholar in the field of Iranian studies and Persian literature, Dr. Domenico Ingenito. Uh, Dr. Ingenito serves as the Associate Professor of Iranian Studies and Persian Literature at the University of California, Los Angeles. He has authored impactful works, including his most recent publications, Beholding Beauty, Sadi of Shiraz, and The Aesthetics of Desire in Medieval Persian Poetry, which was published by Brill in 2020, which focuses on the nuanced aesthetics of um, um, Sadi of Shiraz works. Additionally, Dr. Ingenito has made substantial contribution to the world of literary translations with his recently published critical edition of um, a critical edition and the Italian translation of Fru Farrokhzad's collected poems, uh, which will be um, uh, which he will be actually talking about this particular work today. And at the end of his presentations, we hopefully have um, a quick reading of some of Fru's uh, poems uh, with the Italian and English translations of the poems. Dr. Ingenito currently is engaged with some other compelling research projects that explore the intersections of kingship and eroticism in Ghaznavid praise poetry. Furthermore, he investigates the intricate relationship between artistic creativity and the visual arts in narrative poems of Nezami Ganjavi. We are honored to have Dr. Domenico Ingenito with us today. Please join me in extending a warm virtual welcome to him. Domenico John, the floor is yours. من از نهایت شب حرف میزنم من از نهایت تاریکی و از نهایت شب حرف میزنم اگر به خانه من آمادی برای من ای مهبان چراغ بیار و یک دریچه که از آن به ازدهام کوچه خوشبخت بنگرم ایل دونو یو پرلو دای کنفینی دل نات دل ترمین دل بویو ای پرلو dai confini della notte. Se vieni a casa mia, caro, portami un lume e uno spiraglio da cui puoi guardare la folla nel vicolo felice. Baruch Farogzad. Thank you so much for your kindest invitation. I'm very, very honored to be here with all of you and uh, new friends, old friends and dear colleagues, students. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited today because we are we're, we're here celebrating two things, mainly. One is the artistic heritage of Farooq Farouzad, who can be considered as the most iconic, most important woman poet of modern Iran. And we're also celebrating the power of translation to disseminate the complex beauty of Persian poetry so that the global value of this literary heritage uh, may be recognized internationally beyond all language boundaries and cultural barriers. Um, I, I will talk about, I will present today this, this book I have here with me, which as, as Farshad Sompoldel mentioned, is the, is, is the critical edition of all of Farooq Farooq's work, works based on the oldest 
editions in Persian, of course, that Farazad published during her lifetime, along with an Italian translation. So you can see here you have both the Persian and the Italian text. So this is something that I, it's a work I've been, uh, it's it's a book I've been working on for about 15 years, and and uh, I'm extremely proud of the opportunity I have to thank all Iranians, all Iranian women specifically, all Persian speaking women, for all the affection, human affection, all the love, all the intellectual affection that I received from them uh, over the past 20 years, since the very beginning of my journey with uh, with Persian language and culture and literature. Um, I will share a few notes about the importance of Farooq Farzad's poetry, especially in the context of translation, in the context of modern Italian culture. I will, you know, offer a few sketches on on on, uh, on the biography of Farzad and her poetry, of course. And uh, but before I dive into that, I would like to share a few words about my personal experience with with Iran, with Persian literature, and in particular with. I, I, I grew up in Italy, in southern Italy, and uh, in, on the Amalfi Coast, not far from Naples. And uh, when I was a teenager in high school, I happened to, to learn about the protests that were happening in 1999, in the year 2000, in the University of Tehran. And I read about all these uh, young activists and artists who were trying to bring some change to their country. And I was fascinated by the work of, of uh, photographers, filmmakers, and poets in particular. To me, the question as a young Italian student, my question was, how is it possible that in a country where there are so many social and political limitations, how is it possible to find so many wonderful young artists who are trying to change the rules of their world uh, in such a strong, and subtle way at the same time. So to me, it started becoming the question of a, li of a lifetime. So I started teaching myself Persian, trying to answer this question, trying to, to understand, to discover what the secret of, of Persian, the Persian arts is, and, and uh, why it is, so why art, and specifically poetry, is so impactful in the culture of medieval and modern Iran. So I started teaching myself the language. I was living in Portugal at the time. I was teaching photography in, a, in high school, and I discovered Faruga Farouzad. And, and, and this is a love, an intellectual love story that is still going on. And, and I, I started translating a poetry into Italian, and I published a small booklet, La Strage dei Fiori, Gatle Ome Goldha, uh, when I was in my mid 20s. And, and this book today is the final accomplishment of, of, this, uh, of this project. And uh, um, one of the questions that I had when I was a student, even when I was living in Iran, is where can I find everyone? Everyone talks about Farooq Farouzad. Everyone celebrates her poetry, but where can I find her texts? And I discovered that it's extremely difficult to find her poetry in books that are not censored. Of course, that are still published in the Islamic Republic of Iran, but they're heavily censored. And even the editions that were published in the 70s, before the Iranian revolution, um, we, 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 I realized that they were not they were never really complete. So I started this process in which she was like a scavenger hunt in which I was trying to find the very first editions of, of Farooq's poems. And, and we helped many friends, and including Professor Farzane Milani, uh, and I will talk about her work uh, also soon. Um, I, I managed to collect all the very first editions that are now in this book. They're all here, uh, along with Italian text. So it's uh, it, it gives it gave me a different perspective on 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 the work on the on the entire poet. So on the entire work of this poet, because um, I transitioned from having this scattered, patchy understanding of her poetry to finally seeing what. Farooq Farzad as a as an artistic project, as a wholesome entire artistic project, uh, what its meaning is you know, when when everything is collected and accessible and available now to broader readership. So here we are today, and um, I um, 
I would like to just emphasize that it is a critical in, uh, edition, which means that all the texts are available. So it, it's, it's in, it warms my heart knowing that even readers in Iran would be able to access this book. Uh, there is a critical introduction, and then I'll, I'll have a conversation with Farshad on, on my personal critical approach to Farabza's poetry. You will find the five collections of poetry, four of which were published when Farazad was still alive. So we have Asir, Prisoner, um, Divar, The Wall, Osian, or Asian Rebellion, Favolo di Digat, which is considered a masterpiece of Persian poetic modernism. And a series of, uh, of poems and collections that were published uh, posthumously. So there is the famous Imam Yavarin de Avaz Efasl Esad, Let's Believe in the Beginning of the Cold Season, published in 1974. And then many of you are familiar with Faruga Farazad's work as a filmmaker. So this beautiful short film called Khanes Yahast. And I, I always found the text of this film extremely uh, powerful from a poetic point of view also. So I extracted all the lines that are found in the in the film, and I published them also in the book. There are poems that Farazad published, composed with Yadullah Royai, another extremely important poet, which are probably the last texts that she composed before dying in, 19, in February 1967. There are a few poems that are attributed to Farouk Farazad. Some of you might have heard of Bakodam Dast or um, Atul Tufan, these are poems that we don't really know whether Farug or when Farug wrote them, but I decided to include them in the appendix. In the appendices, you will find also a precious text that was made available by uh, Farzane Milani a few years ago in her wonderful book on, uh, bio, uh, on uh, Farazad's literary biography. Uh, and it's the afterword that, afterword that uh, Farazad composed to defend herself in the first edition of Asir. Uh, and then I have a final essay of about 20 pages, is, which is my critical analysis of all of Farazad's poetry collections. Um, before I present the specific collections by Farazad, I would like to thank all the scholars who come before me, who paved the way with seminal works and without them. I'm not a Farazad specialist. I'm a specialist in medieval Persian poetry. I happen to be a Farazad lover and translator. So it's, I'm becoming, I'm trying to become, I hope to become a Farazad specialist in the years to come. Also thanks to this work of translation. And of course, I uh, there is the seminal work by Professor Michael Hillman, A Lonely Woman, or Rugo Farazad and her poetry, which is an excellent biographical survey uh, on, of Farazad's um, life and works. Uh, and then we have uh, this excellent uh, collection of essays edited by uh, my dear colleague and friends, uh, Dominic Brookshow and Nasrin Rahimiye. Uh, an expanded second edition was published only a few months ago, Farug Farazad, poet of modern Iran, iconic woman and feminine pioneer of new Persian poetry, extremely important publication as well. Um, and then we have this precious book that I learned is being translated into English, finally, by, by uh, the most important, the most iconic uh, scholar of Farabzad studies, Professor Farzane Milani, Zendigi Nami Adabi Hamrabo Name Hoye Chak Nashode, which collects also all the unpublished letters for Farabzad to her family, to her friends, to her husband, uh, and then to her lover, Ibrahim Golestan, who passed only a few months ago. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent book that I recommend to anyone who can read Persian because it offers a, a, a broad and very specific also uh, understanding of, of Farazad's life. Um, so um, we know more and more every year about you know, many details of Farazad's life. We know that she spent, she was born in 1935, at the end of the year, the end of December of 1934, sorry, 1934, and she died in 1967, at a very young age of 32. She spent her youth between Mazandaran and Tehran, 
And she married a distant relative, a distant cousin, at only 15 or 16. And she moved with him with uh, uh, Parviz, Shapur, uh, Parviz Shapur to Ahbaz in the south, in southern Iran. She gave birth to a child, Kamyar, in 1952. And then she published this, this poem that started a real cultural and literary revolution in Iran at the time, Gonah, the Sin, in 1954. And we will see why this poem was was um, baffled all the audiences, all the all the Iranian readers who who discovered this new voice of this young woman who was who was for the first time in the history of Persian literature talking about sex and desire from the perspective of women and and with tones that are explicit and. Uh, unabashedly realistic in uh, and I, I had here the text of the poem I will read it uh, in English translation just to to give it this is my translation as well I sinned a sin replete with pleasure in the hot embrace that set me on fire I sinned while held by vengeful arms resentful arms of steel ablaze in the darkest, quietest corner, I stared into the mystery of his eyes. My heart was quivering inside my chest, elated by his eyes' lustful demands. In the darkest, quietest corner, I sat by him, unsettled. His lips that poured desire into my lips, my heart was freed from the craze of angst. I whispered words of love into his ears. I want you, O oh sweetheart. I want your oh soulful embrace. You, maddened by love, are all I want. Desire kindled flames within his gaze, scarlet wine dancing inside the cup. Amidst the softness of our bed, my limbs were drunkenly shaking atop his chest. I sinned, a sin replete with pleasure, next to a body entranced by passion. My God, how will I know what I did in the darkest, quietest corner? We'll read also the original text with the help of Farshad later on. Um... This was a revolution in the literary um, panorama landscape of Iran in 1954 when the poem was published in the uh, magazine Roshan Fekr. Um, and my question as a translator has been how do we, of course, we translate the meaning, the images, we try to adapt the rhythm in translation, but how do we account for the re revolutionary uh, gesture that comes with a poem like this, published in Iran that is still extremely conservative, not, not as conservative from a religious point of view as the Islamic Republic of Iran today, but culturally, uh, you know, the role of patriarchal values uh, was still extremely present at the time, especially in, in Farozad's uh, family. How do we approach this in translation? How do we convey this 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 um, rebellious voice that that bleeds through these 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 lines? Um, and in my introduction, I try to to explain that first of all, what Farazad was doing by publishing this uh, poem in a magazine with her picture, talking about her husband, talking about her children, her child. Uh, showing also that she was pretending to be in a in an affair with a lover right and so uh, crossing serious boundaries in the in the Iranian societies and ethics of the time uh, how do we deal with this how do we underline the theatrical aspect of this revolutionary uh, provocative gesture so in the introduction I tried to show how this um, is can be com compared to to the way that gay poetry in in Italy in the fifties and sixties had a similar impact. Uh, so, in a society that is not used to certain images, certain depictions, certain explicit sensual representations, uh, can be compared, regardless of gender and regardless of, of uh, erotic orientation. So in the case of Farazad, of course, there is a heteroerotic woman-to-man 
relationship taking shape in these lines, but it's not normative. It's not normative because in the Persian tradition, the object of desire is usually a young man or a woman who is idealized by male poets. And male poets are the only source of uh, desire, of gazing in this in this, in this this uh, tradition. So until Faruga Farugzad's appearance, we don't really see adult men being desired by a woman. We don't see lust and sexuality and, 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 and sensual gazing onto uh, the body of, of a mature man. So Farazad in, introduced this element in the history of Persian literature, just like the same decades in Italy and in Germany as well, a bit earlier than that, probably, um, homoerotic poetry started becoming a thing. It started um, shocking readers. So we need to go think in terms of, of uh, post-gender value, aesthetic values, and impact that that um, the novelty of images can bring to a literary tradition. Um, so um, I, 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 I like to think about Farazad's operation as a, as a performative act in which life and art bleed into each other, are mixed, intermingled with each other. This is also very important if we consider the value of the very first edition that Farogzad published, which unfortunately other translations in Italian and in English never really take into account. And in general, the very early poetic production by Farogzad is discounted oftentimes as juvenile, simplistic, easy. Whereas I try now with my new critical approach toward poetry, I'm trying to let it shine and show the value of this, this theatrical performative events that were taking place with the publication of these poems. And um, we have this initial uh, edition in 1955, 41 poems with 11 illustrations by Mohammad Bahrami. Unfortunately, the illustrations disappear in the, in, the, in the later editions of the work, which was republished in 1956. And in 1963, uh, two poems from the original edition were taken out and five extra poems were added. So we get to the number of 40, 44. What is really valuable about this edition, especially the first edition of Farouzad's Asir Prisoner is, a, is an afterword that appears in which Farouzad, it's, it's, it's a manifesto of uh, proto-feminism in poetry in which Farouzad tried to defend her Self from all the attacks she received when she shocked her audience with the publication of Sin uh, of Gona, the Sin and other poems, and I selected a few uh, passages. I'm translating now the whole uh, for uh, afterward into English. It's the Italian translation is available in my book, and she says something extremely important. We think that this is a 20 year old, 19 year old uh, young woman trying to defend her right to write poetry from the perspective of women, and she says. For those who dismiss my poetry by saying that it conveys exclusively certain explicit erotic images, it would be better for them to study this collection of poems while holding back their judgmental stances. In terms of imagery and content, poetry can be expressed through different stylistic aspects. Each one of those can be artistically valuable by measure of the author's efforts in that specific literary aspect or mood. Should I succeed in perfecting this erotic aspect that some readers attribute to me, I'd be exceedingly satisfied still. I decided with all of my inner strength that I want to remain a woman in my poetry. I did not want to wear a mask of purity and chastity in order to hide inner features of a different kind. As Chayam said, they say I worship wine. Yes, I do. They call me a corrupted drunkard. Yes, I am. Do not dwell on my outer appearance, for I truly am anything, anything I hide inside. And in this introduction, Farazad is stating quite explicitly that why, why can't I, as a woman, talk about desire and sex the way that women do? Why should I pretend to be something else? Why should I pretend to belong to a gender that is not mine? And then there is, she concludes her for uh, afterward with this quite arresting thoughts. Those who want to slander me with these tactics should understand that poetry is a space that frees the artist from all external bonds. I did not devote myself to art and poetry out of amusement or folly. Poetry is my life. 
And what truly matters to me is the emotion of feeling alive. I do not want to surrender to the comfort of the soul and heart. My highest aspiration is to see my poetry become a manifestation of the beauty and pleasure that life can offer to human beings. I want my poetry to explode with emotion and ardor. And I want to pour into the form of my poems all the excitement and enthusiasm that I feel in my life. And no one, absolutely no one, can blame me for this. A woman has the right to be a woman in her poetry too. And those who cannot accept this will have to wait for the day when, with the advancement of civilization and cultural progress, this right will be established for all Iranian women. Extremely powerful words, especially today, especially today, even though these were published in 1955. Um, we all know that Parazad, after the publication of Asir, went through serious hardship. She separated from her husband. Uh, she was, you know, her, the publication of the poetry, of the, those poems was heavily frowned upon. It was celebrated at the same time, but she ended up, unfortunately, she attempted suicide. She ended up in a psychiatric facility. She had to, she was subjected to the, to the torture of electric shock. Uh, um, but she, she managed to stand up again, and she published a year later this beautiful book uh, called Divar, the Wall, which is also which also contains uh, uh, wonderful modernist um, images. Uh, I, I'm showing you Abtani or bathing uh, with one of the pictures that appear uh, there. I'm not sure about the identity of the illustrator for for uh, Divar. Um, and after Divar, there is this transformational trip to Italy and Germany, which is extremely important to me to highlight the, the relevance of this trip. Uh, I think ma many many scholars say that the transformational moment for Farouzad was her encounter with uh, Iranian filmmaker and producer Ibrahim Golestan. I believe that the real transformation happened thanks to her trip to Europe when she started studying Italian and German. And she started translating from German into Persian modernist poetry. So this was the encounter with, with the global dimension of poetry for Farrok Zad, who was already familiar with Proust, with Baudelaire, with the, with the European classics. And she started finding ways to combine her own understanding of classical Persian poetry, Iranian modernist poetry, and European literature in ways that were extremely um innovative and and we have here this pub the publication of this this beautiful book uh titled Ocean or Ocean Rebellion 1958 and eventually the masterpiece known as Tavolodi Digar Another Birth published in 1964. Um I would like to mention also very briefly um how important was um how important were all the arts to, for Faruga Farazad? So cinema, she started making films and she started producing films with Ibrahim Golestan, but she was also very active as a as an actor. Uh, she 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 played the role of the stepdaughter in a famous uh, play by Italian Nobel Prize awardee uh, Luigi Pirandello. Shish Saxiat da Giusto Giulia Yek Nevi Sande, six characters in search of an author. Um, directed by uh, Paris Aubery and staged in Tehran in January 1964, a few months before Tavolo de Digar was, was published. And here we have these images of also the first image that I posted at the beginning of this presentation is from, from this play. So we can see how uh, Parazad is a total artist. She, um, her quest for beauty and the quest for complex, multi layered ways to pronounce beauty transcend the boundaries between different media and and um and also the quest for identity takes place also through through this this uh this approach that she has to to all all the different arts and the way that all different arts can come together and can create this this totalizing um piece of art that is her life experience in a way 
Uh, I was mentioning that it was important for me to retrieve the original publications. This is a poem that is very special. It's very dear to me for several reasons. And uh, it circulates in Persian and English translation uh, with a version that was censored in the 70s. I managed to reestablish the text, Golesor, uh, Golesor, 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 Umarol, Bor de Bal, Golesor, Scarlet Rose, Scarlet Rose, he took me there to the Scarlet Rose Garden. In the dark, he put a scarlet rose in my anxious hair, and in the end, he slept with me upon the petal of a scarlet rose. O oh, paralyzed doves, O oh, trees set free from menopause, O oh, blind windows, now beneath my art, in the depths of my loins, a scarlet rose is sprouting, scarlet rose, scarlet like a stain of blood. Oh, and I'm so pregnant, pregnant, pregnant. Um, so... In translation, one has to take all these variants into account in order to understand the development of a specific author. Uh, and um, and this is it. I really hope that you know, with your questions, we'll we'll be able to dig a bit deeper in this this uh, question of of translating. Paragzat's poetry into Italian and other languages. Uh, and one last thing I want to emphasize is, again, how important the uh, influence of Italian culture was on Paragzat's poetry and uh, the passion with which she was she was interacting with, with Italian filmmakers, even minor Italian filmmakers, when she traveled to Italy in the early 60s also to present her book, uh, her, her uh, film, Hones Hast at different film festivals, uh, especially in Pesaro. Uh, she met with Bertolucci, one of the most important Italian filmmakers. And, and, um, and, and translation, this is what translation does. Translation offers new lives, new lymph to, to the work of artists who are gone forever, you know, but their, 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 their voice, the sound of their voice is still very much alive with us, thanks to the work of all translators, readers, and, and lovers of, 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 of the specs of eternity that we can find in Farouzad's poetry. So I'll stop sharing now, and thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. I believe that we'll read a few poems in three languages with Farshad soon. Thank you so much, Domenico. That was a great presentation. I enjoyed a lot. I took a lot of notes, actually. Uh, so I'll have a lot of questions even after this session <laughs> for you. So, um, but if you want, we can go uh, um, start the reading. We we, we had this. Um, we planned this with Domenico to have a very short reading after his presentations of only three poems by Frug. Um if you're ready for that, we can do that and then move um, to Yes, I'm showing my screen again. So we have... Uh, we're starting with the Aftab Salami Dori, Khamdad. Yeah. Okay, for those of you who already have a copy of the book, it's on page uh, 648. Oh, no, sorry, 646. Should I go first? Yes, please. بافتاب سلامی دوباره خواهم داد به جوی بار که در من جاری بود به ابرها که فکرهای طویلم بودند به رشد دردناک سپیردارهای باغ که با من از فصلهای خشک گذر می کردند به دستهای کلاغان که عطر مزرعه های شبانه را برای من به هدیه می آوردند به مادرم که در آین زندگی می کرد و شکل پیری من بود و به زمین که شهوت تکرار من درون ملتهبش را از سخمه های سبز می انباشت سلامی دوباره خواهم کرد می آیم می آیم می آیم با گیسویم ادامه بوهای زیر خاک با چشم هایم تجربه های قلیز تاریکی با بوته ها که چیدم از بیشه های آن سوی دیوار می آیم می آیم می آیم و آستانه پر از عشق می شود 
و من در آستانه به آنها که دوست می‌دارند و دختری که هنوز آنجا در آستانه پر عشق ایستاده سلامی دوباره خواهم داد Saluterò di nuovo il sole. Saluterò di nuovo il sole e il torrente che mi scorreva in petto. Saluterò le nuvole dei miei pensieri cadenzati e la crescita dolorosa dei pioppi in giardino che percorrevano con me le stagioni più aride. Saluterò poi gli stormi di corvi che a sera mi portavano in offerta l'odore dei campi notturni. Saluterò mia madre che viveva in uno specchio come ritratto della mia vecchiaia e saluterò la terra e il suo desiderio ardente di ripetermi e riempire di semi verdi il suo ventre infiammato sì, la saluterò la saluterò di nuovo arrivo, arrivo, arrivo con i capelli miei procedere di odori dal terreno e questi miei occhi esperienze dense del buio io arrivo con gli arbusti che recisi nei boschi oltre il muro arrivo, arrivo, arrivo e la soglia trabocca d'amore mentre aspetto quelli che amano e la ragazza che è ancora lì nella soglia traboccante d'amore io, lei, la saluterò di nuovo va in manam zani tanha در آستانه فصلی سرد در ابتدا که در که هستی آلوده که زمین و یعص ساد و غمناک آسمان و ناتوانی این دست های سیمانی زمان گذشت زمان گذشت و ساعت چهار بار نواخت ساعت چهار بار نواخت امروز روز اول دی ماه هست من راز فصل ها را میدانم و حرف لحظه ها را میفهمم نجات دهنده در گور خفته است و خاک خاک پذیرنده اشارتی است به آرامش زمان گذشت و ساعت چهار بار نواخت در کوچه باد می آید. در کوچه باد می آید و من به جفت گیری گل ها می اندیشم. به قنچه هایی با ساق ها گلاغر کم خون و این زمان خسته مسلول و مردی از کنار درختان خیس می گذرد. مردی که رشته ها یا آبی رک هایش مانند مار های مرده از دو سوی گلوگاهش بالا خزیدند و در شقیقه های منقلبش آن هجای خونین را تکرار می کنند سلام سلام و من به جفت گیری گل ها می اندیشم در آستانه فصلی سرد در محفل از آگاینه ها و اجتماع سوگوار تجربه های پرید رنگ و این غروب بار ور شده از دانش سکوت چگونه می شود به آن کسی که می رود اینسان صبور، سنگین، سرگردان، فرمان ایستاد چگونه می شود به مرد گفت که او زنده نیست او هیچ وقت زنده نبوده است در کوچه باد می آید منفرد انزوا در باغهای پیر که سالت میچرخند و نردبام چه ارتفاع حقیری دارد آنها تمام ساد لوحی یک قلب را با خود به قصر قصه ها بردند و اکنون دیگر دیگر چگونه یک نفر به رقص برخواهد خواست و گیسوان کودکیش را در آبهای جاری خواهد ریخت و سیب را که سرانجام چیده است و بویده است در زیر پا لگت خواهد کرد ای یار ای یگانه ترین یار چه ابرهای سیاهی در انتظار روز میهمانی خورشیدند انگار در مسیری از تجسم پرواز بود که یک روز آن پرنده نمایان شد انگار از خطوط سبز تخیل بودند آن برگ های تازه که در شهوت نسیم نفس می زدند. انگار آن شعله بنفش که در ذهن پاک پنجره ها می سوخت. چیزی به جز تصور معصومی از چراغ نبود در کوچه باد می آید 
این ابتدای ویرانی است آن روز هم که دست های تو ویران شدند باد می آمد ستاره های عزیز ستاره های مقوای عزیز وقتی در آسمان دروغ و زیدن می گیرد دیگر چگونه می شود به سوره های رسولان سرشکست پناه آورد This is one of the most beautiful poems of world literature. I think that this is one of the masterpieces of world literature you know, of the 20th century. So, uh, and it's only the very beginning. It's a very long poem that uh, I was discussing this with Farshad earlier, that we should do something with it. It should be performed in the streets. It should be performed in nature. We should involve musicians, uh, other performers. It really deserves to be more known and, and uh, we need to play with it much more. So this is the Italian version. Crediamo pure all'inizio della stagione fredda. E questa sono io, una donna sola, sulla soglia di una stagione fredda, dove comincio a percepire l'essenza sporca della terra e la semplice, triste disperazione del cielo e l'impotenza di queste mani di cemento. Passato il tempo, passato il tempo e l'orologio ha suonato quattro volte, ha suonato quattro volte. Oggi è il primo giorno dell'inverno. Io conosco il segreto delle stagioni e comprendo la lingua dei momenti. Sotto terra dorme chi porterà salvezza e la terra, la terra tutta che accoglie a sé è un segno di riposo. Passato il tempo e l'orologio ha suonato quattro volte. Soffia il vento in strada, soffia il vento in strada e io penso all'accoppiarsi dei fiori, penso ai piccoli fiori dei magri steli e sangui e a questo stanco tempo malsano e un uomo passa accanto agli alberi bagnati, un uomo dalle vene come linee azzurre. Serpenti morti che strisciano su per le pareti della gola e ripetono e ripetono nelle sue tempie riverse quelle sillabe di sangue. Salve, salve. E io penso all'accoppiarsi dei fiori. Sulla soglia di una stagione fredda, nella riunione di lutto degli specchi e nel raduno tristissimo delle esperienze pallide e in questo tramonto ormai fertile nella saggezza del silenzio, come si può? Come si può fermare chi, paziente, grave, disperso, così procede? Come si può dire all'uomo che lui non vive, che non ha mai vissuto? Soffia il vento in strada, gli appartati corvi della solitudine volteggiano nei vecchi giorni giardini del malessere e la scalinata punta ad altezze troppo misere. Tutta l'ingenuità di un cuore l'hanno portato al castello delle favole, ma come, come può adesso una persona sollevarsi nella danza e immergere i capelli infantili nelle acque correnti e calpestare sotto i piedi quella mela ormai colta e annusata? Tu, amico, tu, unico, solo amico, quali nuvole nere attendono il giorno di festa del sole? L'apparire un giorno di quell'uccello era come la traccia di un volo che prende forma nella mente, come se le foglie nuove che respirano nella scivia della brezza fossero le linee verdi dell'immaginazione, come se quella fiamma viola che bruciava nel pensiero puro delle finestre non fosse altro che la fantasia innocente della lampada. Soffia il vento in strada, e questo è il principio della rovina, e anche quel giorno c'era vento quando le tue mani si disfacevano. Care stelle, care stelle di carta, come si può, quando in cielo soffia forte il vento di menzogna, come si può trovare riparo nelle scritture di profeti sopraffatti? Thank you so much. Uh, Domenico, I, I think we are running out of time, so um, if you agree, we can move on to questions. So, yes, to yeah. some questions, so, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Absolutely. Thank Great. You. Um, thank you for great reading actually i don't know italian i don't read or understand italian but it's really um effective it's um yeah you know how i feel about like rules poetry and when i heard it in italian that was the first time that i heard it in italian so it was really moving <laughs> so i'm going to ask my question first and then um i just um if you could just uh, um, um, go about it as uh, quick as possible so we can have some of the questions from the audience as well that would be great um i had actually more questions but i'll leave them for later for the interest of the time um my question is that how did you approach the translation of Furuk's 
later poems, um, the Nemaic actually mood of Furu's poetry, considering her distinctive um, perspective on Nemaic poetic forms and prosody, especially. Uh, were you um, influenced by specific tradition in Italian uh, poetry, or you had to invent a new form actually to to somehow capture the essence of Furuk's poetry? Thank you for this question. Uh, it was actually much more difficult to translate the early poems of Furuk Parazag, which are very regular from ethical point of view. So I had to find, I had to work more for that. Whereas for the for the later poems, uh, it felt closer to my approach to metrical experimentation in Italian. So I relied on what has been happening over the past, uh, I would say, 40 years in Italy, especially a, a woman poet. Her name is Amelia Rosselli, who, um, who was experimenting a lot with these long hypermetrical verses. And and uh, so I tried to play with... Uh, with the number of syllables, with the with the stress in the specific lines, and also re um, re uh, combining lines graphically on the page, so trying to translate not only the content but also the effect of the poetry and the musicality, uh, especially with the my poem that we don't have time to read it, but Tana uh, Sedas uh, Kemimonad, it's it's which I translate Sedar not as voice but sound because I'm interested in Farazad's research with sound in that specific context. And so I tried to find a, an Italian um, Italian um, experimental ways to, to, to convey that. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, though, I would love to actually continue the discussion, but we don't have enough time, unfortunately. Let me ask you another question. Uh, well, what, while it might be considered a bold proposition, in what ways do you believe Furu's poetry could exert an influence on uh, contemporary Italian poetry if it it, it can happen uh, somehow? And do you think this potential influence would stem primarily uh, like from the like poetic forms in Furu's poetry or uh, like it's a content impact? <laughs> Very, quite, very difficult question. <laughs> First of all, I would like to clarify and emphasize that the Italian poetic scene is extremely vibrant, as vibrant as the Iranian poetic scene. So it's something that stands, I think that Italy and Iran are quite unique on the global sort of arena of poetry, experimentation, practice of poetry. So there are poetry festivals everywhere. Every small village has, you know, has, has a poetry reading sessions almost every day. It's, it's, it's extremely, it's almost overwhelming to understand the impact. Um, poetry like Faruga, Faruga, the first, but, but the interesting thing, we don't really have a figure, a female figure like Farouk Zad in poetry. That's why my example was with Italian gay poetry in the 50s and 60s, because uh, Italy is so conservative from this point of view that it was easier for audiences to welcome uh, gay imagery, same-sex male-to-male imagery, than the strong presence of an Italian woman in the way that Farouk Zad broke all boundaries in that mm -hmm. experimental. So um, I think that her poetry can offer some sort a source of inspiration for uh, for women who are trying to find a voice that is not that does not depend on the male voice that still dominates the scene in Italy. Uh, and I think that the way that her poetry tries to talk about the self, selfhood and the lyric persona in a very intimate way, but never naive, but never really simplistic, but never simple. It's easy to make that mistake of reading Farazza's poetry as simple or naive. Yeah. Uh, it's not at all. Um, I think this is something that can have an impact today in Italy where over the past 20 years, there's been a strong push toward more intellectual forms of poetic experimentation mm -hmm. and attachment, complete detachment from lyricism. So this can show how lyric expression of inner uh, sentiment can be an experimental endeavor as well. It's not just mm -hmm. a simple juvenile experience. So this is also something very important. And most importantly, 
Farazad now is becoming the voice of Iran in Italy. Mm -hmm. So Italy now, the fact that a major publisher like Bonpiani decided to boldly invest in a bilingual edition like this and introduce all the Persian texts and, and every bookshop in Italy, in all towns of Italy, has at least one copy of this book, mm -hmm. means that Iran now is, is a cultural interlocutor. Mm -hmm. And it brings with it all the tradition, it brings with it all the complexity of the country that unfortunately has been, like in the rest of the West, has been all too often portrayed only as a dark you know, uh, regime and, and, you know, with no cultural history mm -hmm. and so on. So, so this is a turning point for us Italians you know, with respect to Iran. That's great. Thank you. So that, that was actually really insightful. I think um, it might be a topic for another discussion, but... Um, just to quickly mention that what you said about this possible um, influence on Italian literature, we can see that on women's poets after the 1990s in Iran also. Uh, they got the same influence after a like a gap between, um, like a, a historical gap where Furuk's poetry was somehow out of the picture, not entirely, but um, for the most important part of the like post-revolutionary Iran until the uh, 1990s, it was somehow censored or pushed back. Uh, during the 1990s, though, most uh, women poets actually returned to her, and um, in in a similar way that you mentioned, actually the way that they expressed themselves and um, tried to find a voice. And it, in aesthetic aspects of it, actually, it was very interesting for me. Uh, for a while, all my uh, fellow poets, uh, friends, uh, who whom I heard their poetry, reading their poetry, actually, they all sounded like Frul when they were reading their poems. At the same tone, the same, like, um, um, uh, the way of performing the poetry. So um, it might be um, another topic. Which is very different, if I may. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sure, yeah. It's interesting also the way that you said, I never thought about it. It's very different from the way the normal reading, reciting poetry in Iran, yes. culturally, right? The emphasis on the long vowels and this sort of wearing a mask of the poet, the person, whereas where the style is there is this sort of exactly. very, um, uh, this cadence is completely different. She follows the rhythm in a much more subtle way. This is really fascinating. Exactly. I never thought about it. Yeah, exactly. Actually, she, she starts her, her line with a prosodic, like regular prosodic meter, and then she somehow drops it towards the end of the line and it reflects in her uh, performance as well. Mm -hmm. So I just um, read another question for you from Sahba Sh uh, Shayani. Thank you so much for this very insightful lecture and your wonderful fresh perspective on such an icon of modern Persian poetry. Uh, dear Professor Ingenito, I love your analysis of Farrakhzad's journey to new uh, lands as the real catalyst for her shift of perspective and the unlocking of her latent talents, as opposed to the common understanding of it all merely stemming from her encounter with Gulistan. Could you please elaborate a bit on what key experiences during her travels you think helped her be uh, there, want to say, uh, reborn as a poet. Thank you for this question, dear Dr. Shayani, dear colleague and friend, uh, Saba. Um, I, uh, she discovered, from, she, she wrote letters, she wrote a, a, a travelogue that the RDD got that she published, partially published uh, those the same years. It's the encounter with the idea that the realization that she she belongs to the world that her voice is not just the voice of a woman, that her voice is not just the voice of an Iranian woman, that voice is, is the voice of a global poet. And she, she in translations, is, is an alchemical process for her in that moment. Uh, learning a different language, experimenting with her own language, combining, meditating on the classics. She, she becomes more and more interested in Hayam and Hafez during those 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 months in Europe, and 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 they start entering um, in conversation with her own imagery and with uh, what she was what she was doing with Nimaic poetry. So that's that's an element the encounter with Western art and comparing what she was exposed to, the encounter with cinema and theater also in the way that he was becoming, it was it was practiced in uh, in Rome and in Munich where she was spending most of her time. Uh, it's just the global picture she sees 
for the first time and and um she it's it's the 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 effect is immediate and 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 that's why that the poem that the collection that she she completed during those years is called rebellion Ocean. she she embodies the voice of god she critiques her own tradition she she finds a way to reconsider all of of the, the pain of love that she experienced before that moment as an active source of inspiration that takes her way beyond that very first experiments thank you so much um i think we are uh do we have more time i think we yes, are you, i think you, can, you have time for one more question great thank you so um a question from Reza Ahmadi. Thank you, Domenico John, for the excellent talk. I personally learned so much. Frug's poetry is to some extent simultaneous with the sexual liberation movement in the West. Uh, in your opinion, what was the influence of Western literary traditions at the time on Frug's poetry? Uh, you mentioned her stint in um europe briefly during the talk yeah uh it's it's uh it's it's interesting it, she she was exposed to elliot so i think that in manam uh, um 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 let's believe the, uh, the beginning of, of the cold season is also inspired by one of elliot's uh poems she was reading Proust, she was reading uh, Gide, she was reading Baudelaire. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's I, I don't think that there is a direct influence. I think it's more of a mood. She explores romantic poetry in a context in which there was no real romantic movement in Iran in those years. So what we call romantic movement in Western Europe between uh, the Goethe Zeit, for instance, in Germany in the late... Uh, 18th century and first half of the 19th century and then uh, which is interesting because it was also what we call romantic poetry in Europe was also heavily influenced by Persian poetry mm -hmm. we could not understand the origins of romantic poetry in Germany and in England and Italy without taking into account the impact of translations from Persian from Persian classics mainly Hafez, Khayyam, Saadi so I think that she finds that line that Persianate aspect of romantic poetry without really recognizing, without really knowing what it is, and it automatically enters their own production. So it's not about East versus West, Europe versus Iran. It's more about a network of exchanges that predates that that sort of that that um interaction. And she taps into that and she brings it to the forefront of her poetic discourse. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Danica John. I see many thank wonderful you, questions. I, yes, I, 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 I've, have to copied, <laughs> yeah, I've copied all the questions yes, yes. for you all sent you uh, after the talk. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, this was a, a, a delightful talk. Thank you to Dr. Ingenito for his incredible talk. Furur is uh, such a fascinating icon, and uh, we can never get enough of hearing about her and her work. So we really appreciate you being with us today and sharing uh, all this incredible uh, information and your beautiful book. Uh, please note that uh, you may find a direct link to Dr. Ingenito's book, uh, I Speak from the Edge of the Night by visiting farhang.org or via the link that I was uh, just sharing with everyone through the chat. Uh, we are also grateful to Dr. Somboldel for joining us from UC San Diego. And as always, we are grateful to Dr. Janet Afari and the entire team at UC Santa Barbara for organizing this annual series with Farhang Foundation. As always, please visit farhang.org for all our latest upcoming talks, events, and programs. We thank you all for joining us from across the globe for today's talk, and we look forward to welcoming you next time. Until then, we bid you farewell. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.